So welcome everybody to today's edition of our webinar on emerging topics in biomolecular magnetic resonance. Both speakers of today agreed to recording, so uh, we are already in the process of recording and will upload the lectures to the ICMRBS YouTube channel. Uh, for any questions uh, during or after the talk, please use the Q&A box. And today it's my great pleasure to uh, yeah, announce uh, two fantastic stellar speakers, very well known. The first one, Christina Redfield, uh, and followed by Angela Gronenborn. And Christina Redfield uh, will be introduced by Jeff Hoch. Jeff? Well, it's my uh, great pleasure indeed to introduce my good friend, Christina Redfield, uh, who is uh, currently Professor of Molecular Biophysics at the University of Oxford, which is at the, in the uh, department and uh, is in the Department of Biochemistry at Oxford. Uh, so I, I first met Christina when she uh, joined uh, Chris Dobson's group uh, at Harvard University when he was there as an assistant professor. Uh, Christina had just completed her bachelor's degree at Wellesley College. Uh, the, the picture in the upper right is, uh, is the Dobson group, uh, I think around 1981. Uh, we're standing in one of the old... Jeff. So uh, upper right, we're... Uh, Again, is the uh, the Dobson group around 1981 with Christina obviously there in the front row. We're standing in the second floor of uh, the, the Mallinckrodt building on Oxford Street. Appro seems appropriate enough in Cambridge. Uh, it, it, interestingly, it's the it's the old laboratory where the, where uh, the Feesers Feeser and Feeser uh, developed napalm. Uh, for left to right in the back is Ed Olnicek. You'll notice recognize uh, a young Chris Dobson. David States is there right behind Christina of State Saber Corn Rubin fame, Fleming Paulson, and uh, me on the right, and uh, Randy Wedeen uh, directly in front of me. Uh, so Christina joined the group uh, somewhat uh, into uh, Chris's brief tenure as an assistant professor at Harvard, and uh, just around the time he was recruited back to Oxford from where he, he had originated. And so Christina, uh, rather than, than conducting her graduate studies at, at, uh, in Cambridge at Harvard, uh, decamped with Chris uh, to go back to Oxford, which is where she completed the the, uh, uh, the work on her thesis. Uh, and although she received a, a PhD from Harvard in 1984, she completed uh, the work for her, her, her degree uh, at, in Oxford. Uh, in the lower left there, you'll see a picture of uh, which kind of hints at, I think one of the other, one of the reasons that, that Chris recruited Christina back to Oxford was not merely to, to, uh, to work in his lab, but also to serve as a, a babysitter for their growing family. That's uh, one of Chris's sons. Christina, I'm not sure which son that would have been, but um, uh, that's Mary, Mary Dobson on the right. Uh, that was the beginning of a, a, really a lifelong association with, that Christina has had with Oxford. Uh, she uh, was initially a research fellow associated with uh, Lady Margaret Hall, uh, one of the newer colleges at, at Oxford. Uh, more recently, her affiliation has been with Wolfson. Uh, but one of the things that has really characterized her career, uh, uh, in addition to her science, which I'll get to in a second, is her uh, career of, of, and dedication to service to the community. And, and I'm just uh, listing a few highlights here. Back in 1990, uh, there's, here's a picture of her on the terrace. At, some of you know it, the, uh, the uh, venue Il Choco in Barga, Italy. Uh, she co-chaired the uh, NATO Advanced Research Workshop in 1990 on, and I think this may still hold the record for the longest title for a workshop, Computational Aspects of the Study of Biological Macromolecules by Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy. Um, she went on, uh, years later, was chair of the Experimental NMR Conference, or ENC. She serves as editor-in-chief of Biomolecular NMR Assignments, and I'm also quite pleased to say that she serves on the advisory committee for the Biological Magnetic Resonance Data Bank. Her service at Oxford includes uh, uh, a service as a governing body fellow at uh, Wolfson College. Uh, she's also had a, at least one and I possibly two stints, if I'm not mistaken, as uh, acting president of Wolfson College. And on the lower right there uh, is, is a picture, I believe it's around uh, 2015. I think it's on the occasion of the upgrade of the 950 megahertz uh, uh, instrument with the installation of a, of a, a cryogenic probe where, where uh, in the Department of Biochemistry, again, where, where Christina currently serves as professor of molecular biophysics. 
Uh, some of her research highlights, uh, her initial uh, studies focused on NMR of, of lysozyme, and I think there are probably few people in, in the world who know more about the structure and dynamics of the lysozyme than, than Christina. Uh, she uh, went on to uh, uh, work extensively in characterizing protein folding intermediates, uh, unfolding intermediates, and, and of course, uh, extensive studies of, of molten globule states using, using NMR, which is uh, uniquely uh, uh, adept at uh, characterizing of those kinds of dis dynamically disordered states. And more recently, she's been turning her attention to uh, uh, oxoreductases, uh, which is going to be the topic of her uh, talk today. Now, finally, I want to uh, uh, turn to something which, which I hope will become a, uh, 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 a future trend for introductions, which is uh, to, to tell a few, a few things about Christina that you won't see on her CV. Uh, one is that she is an avid fan of the Talking Heads, uh, and she, she tells me she's seen the, uh, the concert film quite a few times. I don't know if it's dozens or not, but it's uh, more, than, more than a few is my understanding. Uh, she also seems to apparently enjoys uh, her single malt whiskey on the on the peaty and smoky side, which which might come as a surprise. But uh, hopefully, the, the one thing that I think hopefully you'll agree would be a bit surprising is that uh, when you think of Christina Redfield, you might associate with uh, with uh, the song "Psycho Killer," which, which uh, is, it comes a little bit surprised when you know her per personality. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn the stage to Christina, and thank you so much, Christina, for for not only your contribution to science, but being a steadfast friend uh, over these many years. Okay, hopefully everybody can see my slides now. Yep. Okay, thanks uh, for the introduction, Jeff. Um, I, I, my, my malt whiskey days are behind me, having given up alcohol completely in 2018, um, but uh, perhaps the interest in the talking heads continues. Um, as you, as you said, I'm going to talk about some of our work on oxidoreductases, uh, in particular DSBD, and this has been a long-standing collaboration with Stuart Ferguson, who recently retired from the Department of Biochemistry. I'm going to start off with a, some of the background, which is mainly work done by Desvina Mavradu when she was a, a graduate student and then a postdoc. She now has her own group in Texas at, in Austin. And then the later work on dynamics is work of Lucas Stetzel, who now has his own group in um, Germany. So in um, gram-negative bacteria such as E. coli, formation of disulfide bonds in the bacterial periplasm is actually controlled by a whole group of proteins. Now you'd think it was a simple chemical reaction, but in gram-negative bacteria, it requires a, a number of proteins. And it can be divided into um, two branches, the thiol oxidizing branch and the disulfide reducing branch. So a protein um, polypeptide chain exported in, into the periplasm will have a pair for example, a pair of thiols, and the very strong oxidase DSBA will react with the protein, leading to formation of a disulfide bond in the target protein and reduction of the disulfide bond in DSBA. Now, if the protein only has two cysteines, this will be the correct disulfide bond, but if you have a number of cysteines, it may be that the incorrect disulfides are formed, in which case you need the action of DSBC, which is a um, isomerase. So that will bind to the misfolded protein and the protein, um, the, the disulfide bonds will be reorganized, isomerized and um, leading to the correctly folded protein. So the protein we're interested in is DSBD and it's the protein that provides reducing power into the bacterial periplasm through its interaction with cytoplasmic thyroidoxin. So DSBD is composed of three domains. Here we're showing a cartoon for the, for the transmembrane domain. That structure hasn't been determined experimentally, but there is now an alpha fold model which confirms the, the eight transmembrane helices. The C-terminal domain of the protein, which is a globular domain within the periplasm, has a typical thyroidoxin fold found for oxidoreductases, whereas the N-terminal domain has an immunoglobulin fold, which is unusual for proteins with an oxidoreductase activity. Um, and the transfer of uh, reductant from, the, from thyroidoxin in the cytoplasm occurs via pairs of cysteine residues via disulfide cascade. Um, so we have a pair of conserved cysteines in the transmembrane domain. They will attack, in the reduced state, attack a disulfide bond in the C-terminal domain. That becomes reduced and that attacks a disulfide bond in the N-terminal domain, leading to a pair of reduced styles in, 
NDSBD, and that can then interact with a number of proteins important in different pathways. Uh, so the chemical reaction is, is in, involves a deprotonated thiolate group of um, the reduced state, a taxa disulfide bond in the oxidized protein, and that leads to formation of a mixed disulfide intermediate. So the formation of this intermediate means that when the two, the two proteins have to form a complex, and in that complex, the, cyst, the, the two pairs of cysteines need to be in close contact. That um, di mixed disulfide is then resolved so that the protein that was originally in the reduced state becomes oxidized and the protein originally oxidized is now reduced. And key in the reactivity is the pK value of this thiol group. So it has to be deprotonated, it has to be the thylate. So one of the first things we did was to look at the pK values in uh, the C-terminal domain of DSVD. We did that with NMR um, using protein C13 labeled with um, cysteine. And these are HS, carbon HSQC spectra collected between pH 4 and pH 12. And if you plot the chemical shift change for the B to carbon as a function of pH, you see a fairly typical titration curve. And from that, you can extract a pK of 10.5. Now that's quite a high pK value for a cysteine. And it makes that cysteine very unreactive. So it's not going to be a very good nucleophile. Um, so the, looking at the active site, it's possible to explain the high pK of the cysteine because of, of two very close um, acidic residues an aspartic acid and a glutamic acid. And by mutagenesis, if you remove those, you can then lower the pK of the cysteine. So the acidic environment within this active site makes the cysteine 461 a poor nucleophile. So how is it able to reduce the disulfide bond in NDSBD? Um, so we then went on to look at the a covalent, a mixed disulfide covalent covalent complex of the two domains. Now here the cysteine is involved in the disulfide bond, so we can't measure its pK directly. But what we could do was measure the pKs of the acidic residues, and we found that the pK of uh, the as aspartic acid 455 is raised significantly from a value of about 6 in the free state to a value of 8.5 in the complex. And so that that's, uh, aspartic acid will remain protonated, and the consequence of that is that the cysteine should have a reduced pK and then this is an example of microscopic pK values, which is something also found in thyrodoxin. So in the complex, the active site becomes um, more hydrophobic in a sense, and that, that um, shield it raises the pK of the acidic residues and allows the cysteine to become more reactive. So this study was done with a covalent complex of the two domains, and we were then interested in looking at the interaction of the two domains in the absence of a linking uh, disulfide bond. And we did that again by NMR. And what we found, if you mix the two oxidized proteins together, here we're looking at um, N15 labeled C domain, we can see that peaks shift and broaden, indicating there is an interaction as you add more of the N-terminal domain uh, to the sample. So there's an interaction between the two proteins when both of the, uh, the, the two pairs of cysteines are oxidized. If we add diphyothreatol reducing agent, uh, that reduces the disulfide bond um, in both of the proteins. And then we don't see any interaction between the two proteins. So the NMR spectrum of the mixture is just the sum of the NMR spectrum of the individual components. So we can see an interaction when the proteins are oxidized and we don't see an interaction when they're reduced. What we're really interested in, in measuring is the interaction when one is reduced and one's oxidized. And you can only do that by mutating the attacking cysteine to an alanine. But what we found was that the um, dissociation constant is dependent on the oxidation state. We have the highest affinity interaction when the C domain is reduced and the N domain is oxidized, um, and a much lower affinity after the reaction has occurred when the C domain is oxidized and the N domain is reduced. So that's around greater than two millimolar for the KD, whereas we have a KD of 86 micromolar for the, the reactive pair. Now these affinities are actually very, very weak and you might think they're of no relevance at all in biological terms, but you have to consider that the, these two domains in, the, in E. coli are both tethered to the transmembrane domain. And so that creates a high local concentration, which we estimate to be around one millimolar. And so with that high local concentration, these kinds of affinities begin to be relevant. So on the basis of the PKs and also the um, oxidation state dependent affinities between the two domains, we were able to come up for a model for how the interaction occurs. So when the two domains are not interacting, we have a high pK for the cysteine making it unreactive, and that protects these thiol groups in the, in the C-terminal domain. 
in this oxidation state combination, we have a, an, a KD of 86 micromolar, so they will associate to form a complex. And in this complex, the PK is lowered, making the cysteine more reactive. And so this thiol the thiolate in the C domain will attack this disulfide bond, and you'll get electron transfer via a covalent um, intermediate. The resulting um, pair of proteins have a much lower affinity for each other, and so they will dissociate. They have a KD of greater than two millimolar, so they will dissociate, and that leaves the thiolate groups in the N-terminal domain free to then interact with other proteins from the DSB or the CCM system, allowing um, transfer of electrons to these other proteins. In the meantime, the C-terminal domain will interact with the transmembrane domain um, and will be itself reduced again. So we then went on, after concentrating on the C-terminal domain, we went on to look in more detail at the N-terminal domain. So this is the domain that has this immunoglobulin fold, and it's a redox hub within the periplasm. So it's the protein that, that um, provides reducing power to a number of different um, important um, families of proteins within the periplasm, di other di the disulfide bond isomerization and cytochrome C maturation. And so the crystal structure of this protein has been determined, and it has a, a, a loop called the cap loop, which really blo blocks access to the pair of cysteines in the active site. So that's in the free state. Crystal structures of the protein, when bound to a partner, this is the CDSVD, NDSVD mixed disulfide complex, this loop is opened. So it opens up in order to allow access of this thyroidoxin fold to the active site of the N-terminal domain. So we were interested in understanding how this opening of the loop occurred. So there are two possible mechanisms you could imagine. Induced fit in which the, the loop stays closed, the, the two proteins form some kind of encounter complex, and within that encounter complex there's some steric factors which lead then to induced opening of the loop and formation of the complex. An alternative is that the end domain on its own occasionally um, samples conformations in which the loop is open, and it's those open conformations which then interact with the C-terminal domain to form the complex. So we were interested in, uh, in understanding how this cap loop behaves in solution, one looking at whether the x-ray structures available are good models for the solution, the protein in solution, um, trying to see if, if we have evidence for flexibility of the cap loop, and if so, on what kind of time scale. Um, and because we see these oxidation state dependent behavior for the interactions of the N-terminal domain, we were interested to know whether the cap loop behaves differently in the two oxidation states. So we measured residual dipolar couplings for both the oxidized and reduced proteins and compared these um, to the predicted RDCs we would get from the crystal structures in, in a fitting procedure. And what we find is really good agreement using these closed crystal structures, so where the cap loop is closed. <clears throat> so from the perspective of RDCs, a closed conformation is what the protein adopts in solution in both the oxidized and in the reduced um, state. We next moved on to N15 relaxation, measured the standard R1, R2, and heteronuclear NOE um, at 600 megahertz, and then analyzed it using the, the model free methodology. And we fit the data using an axially symmetric uh, diffusion tensor. So these are the order parameters that we extract for the reduced state and for the oxidized state. And they're really very similar between two states. We find we have at the, in both proteins at the N and C termini, we have some very flexible residues, but within the core of the protein, we have relatively high order parameters. And in particular, if we look at the cap loop region, which is highlighted here in gray, there's no evidence of lower order parameters in the cap loop compared to any of the beta strands. So on a fast time scale, picosecond, nanosecond, we don't see any evidence for the cap loop being very flexible in either the oxidized or reduced state of, of DSBD. Um, so Lucas, who, who um, did this did the project on the dynamics, then um, carried out some molecular dynamic simulations to look at the behavior of the two proteins um, over a period of one microsecond. Um, so we're looking in, in this, uh, the plots I'm going to show you, we're monitoring the distance between the, the aromatic ring of phenylalanine 70 and the um, sulfur of cysteine 
109, which in the closed state is a short distance, and in the open state, it's a much larger distance based on uh, crystal structures. So if we start off, um, Lucas starts with the reduced state of the protein. What we find this is a 200 nanosecond simulation. The loop, um, the, that distance um, varies, but it, it's pretty much staying closed. This is a second 200 nanosecond simulation. And in a total of one microsecond, this loop stays closed. There no, there's no evidence of opening of the loop. We also did a simulation where we start with the open conformation. And in this example, within three nanoseconds, the loop closes and stays closed. So the, we're, we're taking the open conformation from the complex, but getting rid of the CDSVD partner. By contrast, in the uh, MD simulations of the oxidized state, in this case, we see some um, brief excursions to a more open conformation. In the second 200 nanosecond trajectory, we initially see some longer lived um, transitions to an open conformation. And then at around 82 nanoseconds, we see opening of the loop. And it, although there's a large fluctuations in the distance between um, 70 and 109, it's essentially staying very open during the rest of this 200 nanosecond trajectory. Um, here's an example. If we start from the open conformation, this is an example where the loop closes very quickly, but this only, um, a, it, the rapid closing of the loop only happens in, a, in about three of the 10, 10 nanosecond trajectories that we ran starting from the open state. This is a summary of the, the other 600 nanoseconds of the trajectory, and you can see for the reduced state, the loop just stays closed the whole time, whereas in the, um, in the oxidized state, we see in all of these simulations, we see some evidence for opening. This is another um, fairly long-lived open, open um, transition of a, more than 20 nanoseconds, and some of these are much shorter um, openings followed by closings. You can see here it stays open for 20 nanoseconds, but then it closes again. Um, so some, looking at the, distance, the distribution of distances between the ring of phi 70 and the, and the cysteine, you can see in the reduced state that loop is always staying closed, although perhaps sampling slightly more open conformations than seen in the crystal structure. Whereas in the oxidized state, we have a population of a, a much more open loop conformation. And so we wanted to understand what it was about the protein between oxidized and between having a disulfide bond and not having a disulfide bond that determined this opening behavior for the loop. And the most striking thing that came up in the analysis initially was the behavior of the side chain of phenylalanine 70. So in the reduced state, the phenyl phenylalanine 70 is all, almost always, except for this very small excursion here, found in the, in the Gauche minus uh, conformation. Whereas in the oxidized state, it's making many, many transitions between the Gauche minus and trans conformation. Some of these are very quick. Some, in some cases, it's lo longer lived in one or the other of, of the conformations. So if we look at the structures, it means in the reduced protein, there's a single conformation to this aromatic ring. It packs very nicely against the two cysteine thiol groups and is always present in this Gauche minus conformation. Whereas in the oxidized state, we have an almost equal distribution of, of trans and Gauche minus. So the ring can adopt two different conformations. Um, and this is an example of what's called local structural frustration, which is the existence of competing local interactions that can lead to a dynamic equilibrium between distinct conformations. So we have this frustration in the oxidized state, but not in the reduced state. So the question is really why, why given that we have this structural frustration of V70, how does this lead to the opening of the loop? And we initially looked for a simple answer. So is it the existence of the trans conformation that leads to the loop opening? And what we, what we did was analyze in, in some detail exactly what happened immediately before loop opening. And it isn't as simple as the trans conformation or when a transition occurs between gauge minus and trans. If you look at each of the loop opening events, they, they, they don't show a consistent pattern. So there isn't a simple trigger for opening of the loop. Um, we looked at a number of things, the distance between both the phenylalanine 70 and the tyrosine 71 ring and the cysteine. And you can see that, that um, this is the point at which the loop opens. At that point, this, the distance to the tyrosine gets smaller, but in, the, in this open conformation, 
location, that distance can also increase. Um, that we looked at the distance between the two aromatic rings, and there isn't a simple explanation for why the loop opens. But if you look at the dynamics or the amount of movement of these two aromatic rings, it's substantially greater in the oxidized state of the protein because of the structural frustration of the phi 70 ring than we see in the in the reduced uh, species where the mobility of the two aromatic rings is is greatly reduced. These are some snapshots from the MD trajectory. Um, and the, the top row are various different closed conformation or conformations when the cap loop is closed, and the bottom shows various conformations when the loop is open, particularly focusing on in, in light green, the aromatic ring of phi 70 and in gray, the aromatic ring of tyrosine 71. And you can see there are a number of different relative orientations of the, of the two, these two aromatic rings. You can see in this closed conformation, the tyrosine uh, 71 becomes quite exposed. You can see in the open conformation, there's some conformations that are, that are much more open than those may be the states which can actually bind to a partner protein. Here at 93 nanoseconds, you can see that the loop is um, apparently beginning to close, but it doesn't close completely because here by 96 um, nanos 8 nanoseconds, it's opening again. And you can see closure of the loop is blocked by this tyrosine 71 ring so the tyrosine gets in the way of the loop closing completely and so the loop reopens and we can see this blocking conformation occurring in some of our simulations where we start with an open conformation and, and find that the loop doesn't close immediately. So we've got two different uh, situations. We've got the reduced state where the loop is closed all the time and there's no evidence for loop opening and an oxidized state where we're sampling um, some open conformations. And it appears to be the dynamics of the two aromatic rings being um, with a, more, a much higher RMSD in the oxidized state than the reduced state that, it, that occasionally leads to opening of the loop. Now, an interesting observation is made in the crystal structure of NDSVD from Neisseria. So we've been looking at the E. coli protein and in the E. coli protein, in all crystal structures of the isolated endomane, the loop is closed. The Neisseria protein crystallizes with six different molecules in the asymmetric unit. And those six molecules have very different conformations for uh, the cap loop. So this protein is only 27% homologous to the E. coli sequence, but these the aromatic residues um, at the positions corresponding to 70 and 71 are conserved as aromatic rings. Interestingly, in this crystal, there's one molecule of the six in the asymmetric unit actually has the loop in an open conformation, and that overlays very well with one of the snapshots from our MD simulation. The crystal also has a number of closed orientations, and in particular, the two aromatic rings that are homologous to residue 70 adopt two different conformations, which are quite similar to the two frustrated conformations that we observe um, in the MD simulation. And that suggests that this structural um, frustration found in the oxidized protein is, is certainly widespread amongst these NDSBD proteins from other uh, bacterial species. Um, so just the conclusions from the um, MD or the dynamics part of the talk is that we're really seeing in MD simulations very uh, clear differences between the oxidized and the reduced proteins. Um, and the information, somehow information about whether the cysteines are in, have a disulfide bond between them or not is transmitted to the, to the cap loop. And this cap loop is what acts as a gatekeeper, either protecting the active site or making the active site accessible. In the reduced protein, the cap loop stays closed. And that's probably important because the reduced thiols in NDSBD would, um, if they were accessible to other proteins in the periplasm, you'd have rapid oxidation of these cysteines by the, the oxidase DSBA. So we can, we can imagine for the reduced state of NDSBD, it may be that the, um, it's an induced fit mechanism that leads to formation of the, the biologically relevant complex, that they need to form an encounter complex. And then in that encounter complex, DSBC or CCMG makes a particular interaction that then induces opening of, of the cap loop. Whereas in the oxidized state of the protein, we're seeing these two alternative um, closed conformations 
indicative of the local structural frustration. And then because of dynamics occurring in this region, we see an opening of the cap loop. So for the oxidized state of NDSBD, it may be we have spontaneous loop opening. And so it can be a conformational selection mechanism that leads to formation of the, the complex with reduced CDSBD. And so in this case, um, it's not necessarily a question of whether we have conformational selection or induced fit. We may have both of them, but which mechanism is, is the important one depends on the, the redox state of the N-terminal domain uh, of DSPD. Um, so this, this study was published in eLife. If you want, there's a lot more detail in there about all the different fluctuations that occur around the active site and, and the cap loop. And I'd just like to, to end by acknowledging co-workers on this. All the work on NDSBD and the dynamics was done by uh, Lucas Stetzel when he was a graduate student. Despina Mavradu worked, did all the work um, on the C-terminal domain as a graduate student and then a postdoc and also helped Lucas, who wasn't very keen on protein preparation. So she was fantastic at making all the samples. Mark Sanson, who's recently retired from our department, um, was the co-supervisor of Lucas's work, particularly for the molecular dynamics. And then this is a long-term collaboration with Stuart Ferguson. In. I didn't have time to describe some of the relaxation dispersion experiments we did, but those Andy Baldwin and Fleming Hansen from University College London helped Lucas with some of the, the data analysis. So thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Christina. Lo lovely talk. Um, um, Perhaps I'll, I'll uh, we'll start with a question. The, would it be correct to say that that the modulation of the of the PKs uh, that's so important in the reactivity uh, uh, reflect a, a sensitivity to the local electrostatic environment? Uh, yes, I think the I think the the local electrostatics change so that you can you can measure that by me you can change you can measure the PK of four and the glutamic acid. In fact, in the free protein, those residues have somewhat different PKs, whether the protein is in the oxidized or reduced state. So I think that the, the, it, the PKs are very sensitive to the local environment. Um, when we did that study, the, the programs available to predict PKs were not really very good. So you can take the crystal structure and do a prediction, but they, they weren't able to predict the kinds of um, values that we were measuring experimentally. One of, the, one of the things I'm, that leads me to wonder is whether uh, the reactivity and 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 by and maybe by extension the dynamics might uh, be sensitive also to uh, to uh, to the osmotic environment that is you know the uh, salt tolerance I mean, you know what what the uh, how much salt is in in the uh, the bacterium's uh, environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, also because the proteins because they're tethered to the transmembrane domain, they're actually quite close to the surface of the membrane. So the PKs there could be also affected by the electrostatics on the, on the surface of the, the bacterial membrane, periplasmic membrane. Uh, John Bushweller uh, has, has a question. Uh, while the structure of the transmembrane domain of a DSBD is not known, the transmembrane structure of the DSBD homolog CCDA is known. Solution structure and ele elevator mechanism, mem membrane transporter CCDA is in, uh, published in Nature Structural Biology. Have you used the structure to try to model domain interactions in DSBD? Um, we haven't done that. In some ways, the, the people who were working on this project ha have left Oxford, so things have slowed down a lot, but it certainly it would be something of interest. We're, we're still working on a paper um, from some of Lucas's other work where he, um, and he's been looking at an alpha fold um, model for the transmembrane or actually for the full length protein and doing some MD simulations with that. Um, but yeah, I should, I should look at the homo that published homologous structure and see if that provides us with some, some insights. Uh, Philip Neudecker asks, uh, do your MD simulations allow any conclusions about the thermodynamics of the cap loop states? Uh, in, in fact, it's intriguing that your, your distributions suggest that there's a, there might be a detectable population of, of, of the, of the uh, uh, lower population state, and, and maybe you could hint at what you might have found in your relaxation dispersion studies. Um, yeah, so we, in the 
I think one microsecond isn't really a very long MD simulation. So pro pro probably th this work was done many years ago by Lucas. Nowadays, you would probably do a much longer MD simulation to get better statistics on the population of, of open or closed states. Certainly the, the two locally frustrated confirmations seem to be roughly there in a 50-50 population. And there's some evidence we see averaging of, of beta proton chemical shifts for that oxidized state, whereas we don't see that for the for the reduced state. The um, relaxation dispersion, so there, if I can maybe just show a quick. So, yeah, so we did relaxation dispersion and um, we see no, dis no evidence of dispersion in the reduced state and we can see dispersion in the oxidized state, which when Lucas first did this, we were very, very excited about it because we thought, okay, the, the excited state's gonna have the loop open. But when we analyzed uh, the chemical, so you, for the, in the fitting, we got the nitrogen 15 chemical shift differences and they really didn't correlate at all with an open or disordered conformation for the loop. Intriguingly, what they do, what they do um, seem to show is that the 2% the, the excited state that we can observe correlates with a reduced like confirmation and we think that something similar to what Art Palmer has seen in BPTI that the, you get isomerization of these disulfide bonds on a slow time scale so we think that there's a very small population of molecules in the oxidized state that ab adopts different um, so chi1 chi2 torsion angles for the two cysteines which are more like the reduced state but that the, the loop actually stays closed. So we couldn't find any evidence that the, this excited state had an open loop. It seems to be a closed loop structure. Hmm. Jeff, can I jump in with a follow-up? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, presumably then you also might be interested in side chain relaxation of the aromatic rings. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that would be definitely be something something to to follow up on. Um, we haven't done that. We didn't, I think for the N, the NDSBD is much more difficult to produce than the CDSBD. So we we never, I think we did have some C13 labeled protein, but only that was used when we did the initial assignments. Um, so we haven't looked at the dynamics, say, of the aromatic rings, but that would be, uh, that would be very interesting. Um, I think you probably answered it um, by silence when you were talking about the isomerization of the chi-1 angles for the disulfide is presumably then in the MD simulation when you have the two alternate conformations of the phenylalanine ring, that's not correlated with a change in chi-1s of the disulfides. No. Um what we see. yeah so what you can see in the md simulations is the so these are the two these are the chi1 values of the two cysteines in the reduced state and this is the oxidized state so they're different and what you can see in md is that you get either one or the other of the two chi1 angles makes occasional excursions to a more reduced like conformation but we never see both of this the cysteines go to the reduced like conformation and it could it could be that on the on the one microsecond time scale of the simulation we never you know it, it could be that that it rarely does populate um, this position down here it's just that we don't see it on the the time scale that we've been able to do a simulation but there's no correlation it spends most of the time in this one um, with the with the kind of crys the crystal structure pair of chi1 value so it's not correlated to the change in the um, position of the aromatic ring. So uh, Stefan Nebel uh, was, was a little bit prescient with this question. He writes, uh, really nice talk, thanks. Do you have any experimental evidence of isomerization of assisting <laughs> sites? If so, any difference in the two redox states, could this potentially influence loop opening in the oxidized state? Thanks, Stefan. Yeah, so I think... Uh, yeah, I think in the in the reduced state where the the aromatic ring packs in a, a single orientation with respect to the two cysteines, you can observe some very um, significant upfield shifts of one of the two cysteine of the of both of the beta protons of one of the cysteine residues, which are consistent with that packing. 
actually in the oxidized state, we can't, we don't see the peaks from the, the NHs of the cysteine. So we have some peaks that are broadened beyond detection, which is definitely the two cysteines in the oxidized state. So we can't do any measurements directly for those cysteines in the oxidized state. We did some mutagenesis where we remove part of the cap loop and then the dispersion disappears and you can see um, you can see the peaks. The problem is that mutagenesis removes the tyrosine and the phenylalanine 70 and 71. And so the, the fact that you don't see dispersion could just mean that you've removed some ring current effects which give rise to the different environments that give rise to dispersion. So I think the absence of the dispersion doesn't necessarily mean the motions aren't there. It just means the, possibly the source of the chemical shift differences aren't there anymore. Oh, I don't see any open yeah. questions. Uh, Art, uh, you had your hand up. You, you, yeah. I was uh, just going to, for, for the students um, in attendance, I should not take too much credit, but thank you anyway, Christina. The observation of the disulfide isomerization was first made by Odding and Vutrick a long time ago. Um, my lab just beat the problem to death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, that's, that's true, because BPTI had, had some broadening from the very from the very from the very early days, yeah, definitely. Um, and actually, as a, another a final message to students, the whole time that Lucas was doing this and writing his thesis, I kept asking him why does the frustration lead to the opening of the cap loop, but he would never tell me the answer and never wanted to look at the data. And then when we submitted the paper, of course, what was the question that the referees asked? Why why does the cap loop open? So one of, by then Lucas had left. So my, my first project during the first COVID lockdown was to learn how to analyze MD simulations and try to figure out why the loop opened. So message to students, if your supervisor asks you to do something, you should do it because probably the referees will ask the same. <laughs> yeah. Christina, you mentioned at the outset that the, uh, the integral membrane uh, form uh, has an alpha fold structure and, and it quote unquote confirmed the existence of the transmembrane uh, yeah. domains or domain. Um, is there, uh, how valuable is that alpha fold structure beyond just confirming the, uh, uh, the transmembrane portion? Does, does, is it, as far as you know, is it consistent with the available experimental data? Well, it also, I think it, the, one of the, the mysteries with the transmembrane domain is how the, how the cysteines are accessible to thyroidoxin on one side of the membrane and also accessible to the C-terminal domain on the periplasmic side, which the alpha fold prediction definitely doesn't um, answer that. Lucas has done some MD simulations of um, the full length protein. So alpha fold also predicts the, the um, periplasmic domains correctly, although of course those structures are in the database that it's using. So I think um, pr probably there's a lot more work required, but I think the availability of the predictions, but also of, of structures of homologous proteins may, may lead us some way to, to understanding the system uh, in a bit more detail. If there are no further questions, uh, let, uh, I want to thank you again, Christina, for, for a delightful talk. And uh, thank you for the heads up. I will not bring a bottle of wine on my next visit. <laughs> I'll think of something else. With that, let me turn the podium back over to Marcus, uh, who will uh, take us into part two. Thank you, uh, Jeff, and of course, Christina. So. Uh, now I will hand over to Ed Bex, who uh, agreed to introduce Angela Gronenbaum. Uh, thanks, Marcus. And uh, li I'd like to start out by uh, the, uh, thanking you for the opportunity to introduce Angela Gronenborn. I, I won't follow in uh, Jeff's footsteps with a very elaborate introduction because the, the clock is ticking. And Angela is been such a prominent member of the protein NMR community for well over 35 years that many of you or all of you are quite familiar with her, I presume. Otherwise, you wouldn't be attending this this uh, symposium or this this uh, mini series. Um, but a, a few details about her past. Uh, she got her PhD originally in organic chemistry, something you might not have been aware of uh, back in Germany before uh, moving into protein NMR with uh, 
then a leader, now retired, Jim Feeney at Mill Hill in uh, London, uh, before starting her independent career at the Max Planck Institute in Munich. Then I and my colleagues were very lucky to snatch her away from the Max Planck and join us here at the NIH to start a program on uh, HIV targeted uh, structural protein NMR work. Uh, so she spent about 15 years here at NIH before uh, moving on to Pittsburgh where she currently is the uh, Rosalind Franklin Professor and Chair of the Department of Structural Biology. Um, she's got many distinguished honors. Uh, she was elected to the US National Academy back in 2007. Uh, she's a member of the Norwegian Academy of Sciences uh, as well, that um, reflects her uh, close association with the Norwegian scientific community. Um, She's been elected to the German Academy of Sciences. Um, she's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She received numerous prestigious awards, including the uh, ASBMB Mildred Cohn Award, another one of our, our heroes in protein NMR, biological NMR, I should say, Mildred Cohn, who passed away about eight or nine years ago, I believe. Um, she received the Richard Ernst Prize in Magnetic Resonance, one of the most prestigious honors that one can get in Magnetic Resonance. Uh, the Ebright Wilson Award from the ACS, reflecting on her um, enormous contributions to the technology, NMR technology, that she's played a major role in the development of protein NMR uh, methods. Um, Applications, she's done an enormous number of, of high profile applications uh, showing the utility of NMR, uh, now also integrating it with cryoelectron microscopy. Um, of the many applications that, that she's uh, worked on, I, I mentioned the capsid protein, HIV capsid, uh, the crystalline proteins <laughs> involved in the eye lens and cataract formation, ubiquitin ligase, which perhaps is related to the topic of her uh, to, of today's talk, I'm not sure, uh, and, and many, many other contributions. I'm not going to mention the hobbies outside of, uh, that are not on her CV, so, and her preference for the various alcoholic beverages, we'll leave that out here in this public forum, but you may find her on, on hikes at conferences, she likes to walk, she likes to ski, and um, at, with this, uh, I should stop here. The clock is ticking, Angela, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Art. And while I get uh, my talk up here, you said far too much about all of this, and you didn't quite get what my talk is about. And it's something very new and Hopefully it will come out in either the next issue of JAX or one of the next issues of JAX. And it's something that we stumbled upon in a unusual way. And as most of you know, I always like to start my talks with a very different type of introduction and I hope you can watch this tiny little movie here that is related to what I will talk about. As you know that my lab has been working quite a bit on fluorination and fluorinated proteins. And the story I'm telling you came about because an extremely talented postdoc in the lab 
Man Man Lu was working on a fluorinated protein in a completely different context. And the protein is cyclophilin A. But it also brings home the fact that fluorination and fluorine chemical shifts are very sensitive to their environment. Here on this first slide, you see the spectra of the four different fluorinated tryptophanes and the individual resonances for the tryptophanes are in the lighter color. Here is seven fluorotrip, here is five fluorotrip, here is six fluorotrip. And when it gets incorporated into a protein, you have, again, different chemical shifts. And the only thing that is in common for all of the proteins that I looked at is that the seven fluorotrip modification, wherever it is in a protein, is always at the higher end of the spectrum. And the other ones are between, let's say, 43 and 53 ppm. And there is really no understanding yet is why those resonances are in those particular position. But what it tells you that we can use them as a very sensitive tool to look at what happens in a protein structure. Now, not only are fluorinated tryptophans useful for NMR, they're also very useful in fluorescence. And those of you, and Art Palmer is certainly a fluorescence person, who know about fluorescence would know that four fluorotrip and seven fluorotrip are basically non-fluorescent at all compared to the natural tryptophan, the five fluorotrip, and the six fluorotrip. So those tryptophans have been used in the past frequently to silence tryptophan fluorescence or to augment tryptophan fluorescence when people use fluorescence to study proteins and protein dynamics. So having those proteins around, Man Man made a very unusual discovery because when she used 7-fluorotrypsip A and just wanted to characterize the fluorescence, she noticed that when the protein was in the cavette, that after a while, there was this signal that appeared and it became stronger and stronger. And when I see something like that, and this is really for the students, the first thing you tell the student or the postdoc, repeat your experiment. This is sort of unusual. If it doesn't hold up, forget about it. And Man Man repeated the experiment, and then she decided she really repeated, needed to repeat it again. And it did hold up. So putting 7 fluorotrip sip a into the fluorimeter and looking at 282, after a while, you end up with a rather intense fluorescence. And if you just look here at the intensity of the excitation peak and the emission peaks, the black is before the protein has been in the cuvette in the fluorimeter, and the blue is after. So you really see an intense fluorescence with an excitation peak at 304 and an emission peak at 337. And you can then also follow the time with which this fluorescence occurs. And it's a first order reaction with a rate constant of roughly 0.06 per minute. So what is this unusual molecule that generates the fluorescent. So this was the big mystery we had to follow up. Obviously, the first thing you do, or we generally do, we look at the mass spec. And before you re uh, exposure, you have whatever you would expect for your protein. 
And after you see a new peak coming up, that's roughly between 19 and 20 Dalton difference. So what could it be? We have the seven fluoro trip in there and 19 sounds suspiciously like a fluorine atom. So we scrutinize the literature to see whether anything has ever been reported on losing a fluorine from a tryptophan, and especially the seven fluoro one, when you expose it to UV light. What we know is that obviously when we have a fluorine here, we have sort of a partial negative charge at the seven and four position and partial positive charges at the an epsilon nitrogen in the three position. So looking through all the literature, the only thing we found that there was a report quite a while ago when people looked at four fluoroindole molecules and this is the molecule they looked at. They shone light on it and noted that you end up with what they called a high molecular weight material and a substitution of the alcohol here at the position where the fluorine was. So we thought, hmm, maybe if this is possible for four fluoroindoles, maybe it could be possible also for seven fluoroindole. And what my man did, she took the sample after it had been in the fluorimeter and put it into the NMR tube and looked at the fluorine spectrum because we constantly run fluorine spectra. So what you see here before the UV, you have your single fluorine signal for the seven fluorotrypsip A. And after it's been in the cavette and goes back into the NMR tube, you actually see a signal for free, free fluorine. So we do see defluorination of the trip in this particular protein when it gets exposed to 80, to 80 nanometers. Now, being an NMR lab, we obviously can also look at the HSQC spectrum. And before UV, you have the nicely folded uh, appearance, or there you have the appearance of a nicely folded protein, and CYP A has been studied to death by lots of different labs, and all of the resonances are in the place they should be. Well, after UV irradiation, you suddenly see a lot of new resonances emerge. And some of those seem to be associated with more than one. And there's maybe a mixture of things. And I've just blown up here one of those resonances where you can see several. And you can see that we have one resonance still at the original position and two new ones coming up. So how do we find out what this, these new species are? Again, we've used just seven fluorotrip, put it into our cuvette and then looked after UV exposure, what the spectrum looks like. And it's obviously a nice small molecule spectrum. And you can see that you have new resonances coming up here here and here. And in the different spectrum, you see them prominently sticking out. When you compare those resonances with 7-hydroxyl tryptophan, the spectrum is shown down here, you immediately realize what has been formed out of the 7 fluorotrip is 7-hydroxyl trip when you use the isolated amino acid. Now, again, trip is fluorescent, and we have here the typical emis uh, emis uh, excitation and emission spectra for the tryptophan. However, 7-hydroxyl trip is again non-fluorescent. So this could not be a species that would give us this unusual tryptophan fluorescence. And what I've shown here is you 
take now it's the scale is obviously a much expanded scale here is the seven hydroxyl trip and if you compare that with the seven hydroxyl trip after the irradiation yes some fluorescence gets formed but it's very similar to what happens to the seven fluoro trip after uv exposure so we still don't know what it is and this is an intensity that's much much less than what we see for the protein so this definitely cannot be what's happening in the protein but it tells us that it is possible to generate 7 hydroxytrypsin a from the 7 fluorotrypsin a when you put it into a fluorescence cuvette and expose it to 282 nanometer light. The way we in the end did come up with what is happening was very much helped by mass spec. So we took the protein, trypsin digested it before and after UV exposure, and then looked by MSMS to see what's going on. We noted that there was a cross-linked peptide linking a stretch of amino acid from isoleucine 56 to arginine 69 to a small peptide around a tryptophan, tryptophan 121, ranging, and that peptide ranged from threonine 119 to 125. So this told us that somehow there was a link created between two peptides of the protein. And when we then did all the fragmentation and got all of the fragments in there, we could uniquely link the or position the crosslink between the phenylalanine 60 and the tryptophan 121. So what is in that sample? And I told you we had several species in the spectrum and painstakingly Man Man had to do the assignments Obviously, we, we, we have the assignments for the, for the seven uh, fluoro trip because that we have cleaned beforehand. She then also made seven hydroxy fluoro trip, got the assignments of that. And then she went into the spectrum of the protein after exposure and assigned all of the backbone resonances. And here you can see for some of them, we have for the seven fluoro trip, the resonance is over here, the 7-hydroxyl trip, sip a is here, and then we have a tiny amount of something else and what we called here our cross-linked species. So we really could assign all of the resonances in that mixture. And from the peak intensity, and we only used uh, resonances that were very well separated and clean-cut and I know those numbers are not absolute numbers, we could roughly estimate that in the sample after exposure to UV light, we had 25% left of the original 7 fluorotrypsin A, roughly 30% of the 7 hydroxyl one, 30% of the cross-linked one, and a little amount around 10% of something we didn't know what it was. Now, those of you in the HIV field may know that the reason we work on CYP-A is nothing really to do with CYP-A, but it actually binds to the capsid protein, and that's where, the, where this whole work started from. And then Man Man decided that she was trying to see whether we could sort of enrich or purify this cross-linked species in order to characterize it better. Now, she took advantage of the fact that the sip a binds to capsid and it binds to capsid right at this active site that is flanked 
by the phenylalanine 60 and tryptophan 121. Now the argument was that if there is a crosslink, whatever kind that closes those two sides of the active site where the capsid cyclophilin binding loop gets into, this should no longer be possible and thereby using a large excess of capsid protein would be able to bind to the 7 fluoro cyclophilin A, the hydroxyl trip cyclophilin A, but not to the crosslinked species. So what she did, made a huge bucket of capsid protein and reacted it together and then took the supernatant of this reaction because you can precipitate cyclophilin with assembled capsid and that's what she did, get rid of the precipitate and saw what's in the supernatant. And as you can see here, this is what the seven fluoro trip before UV looks like. Here we have it after UV and we have this sort of small peak here of what we call the cross-linked CYP-A. And when you use the capsid protein assembly and precipitate, you end up with a enrichment of what we call the cross-linked protein. So also at the time, we wanted to understand what's going on with this fluorescence. And more than 15 years ago, I had a collaboration with the late Lenny Brandt of John Hopkins, which one of the big people in, in fluorescence. And Dima Toptigin, he was working with Larry at the time. And of all things, we published a paper about fluorescence with 5-fluoro trip and trip in GB1. So I told Man Man, if you need to understand the fluorescence, you have to contact Dima and talk to him. So what he then did, uh, fired up his old machines that he himself built at the time and looked at the fluorescence. And what I show here is the, always the difference between the unpurified ex UV exposed mixture and the enriched purified mixture. And what you can see that it's only one of the components, what is called component one here, which we then equate to the cross-linked species that get enriched and get higher in the purified one. But all of the species can be assigned and deconvoluted uh, from the uh, um, spectra, both emission and uh, sorry, uh, excit excitation and emission spectra and analyzed. And that's what Dima did. And not only did he do uh, single valley decomposition, he also uh, is, is known for doing time correlated single photon counting. And from that, he also got the quantum yield. And what was gratifying to see that both the single value decomposition and the time correlates at single photon counting uh, spectroscopy gave the same results for the different species with species one being what we call the cross-linked species. And from that we also got obviously the quantum yield which is significantly larger compared to what you would get for your normal tryptophan containing um, cyclophilin A. So we know something about the fluorescence, we know something about the fluorine spectra, but that's obviously not good enough. So again, painstakingly, Man Man had to assign the entire spectrum, not just the HSQC, 
She did all of the assignments of the cross-linked species in that mixture sample. And what was very obvious was that when you looked at the phenylalanine 60 spin system, there was no hydrogen attached, which suggested to us that this cross-linking does occur at the para position of the phenylalanine ring. She then went on to calculate a structure, collect all the NOEs as we normally do, and calculate a structure. And obviously, we needed some help calculating a structure because there is no topology file for a cross linked tryptophan to the para position of a, a phenylalanine. And that was generated for us by Charles Schwieter so we could actually calculate a structure. And the structure is shown here. Obviously, the overall fold is very similar to what you would expect for SIP A. And here is the cross-linked SIP A superimposed on the seven fluor trip structure, which Manman solved by X-ray crystallography, or superimposed on the wild type SIP A structure. You can see there is really very little difference. The only difference you see is where the connection here is between the tryptophan and the phenylalanine. And in the structures in our ensemble, when you look at the, let's say, 20 lowest energy conformers, you can see very clearly what the orientation and the disposition of the two rings are although we end up with two clusters which are slightly different in the angle between the two rings and whether this is just a reflection of how we calculated the structure or whether they are truly those two slightly different orientations of the tryptophan ring obviously we don't know at the current time and if people want to look at the structures there in the B pdb and the resonances assignments are in the BMRB. Now, having established that this is possible to happen with cyclophilin A, the question was, is this just a, is this a general phenomenon? And as I mentioned, we work a lot on fluorinated proteins. So we took fluorinated proteins that were hanging around in the lab to some degree and we made four fluorotrip and seven fluorotrip different proteins. We made the four fluorotrip sip A, and as you can see, nothing happens. So in four fluorotrip sip A, we do not end up with this uh, fluorescence intensity that comes up after you expose the protein at 282. We have a protein called OA. It's a lectin that binds carbohydrates, and it also has a tryptophan and a phenylalanine sort of suspiciously close in the structure. Actually, it has two of those in the relay symmetry related domains. And neither the fluoro four fluorotrip nor the seven fluorotrip ended up with some real fluorescence uh, generated. We looked at the capsid protein CTD, which we worked on. And since it only has one tryptophan in the helix that makes the dimer interface, we then thought, okay, let's make a mutant where we put a phenylalanine close so that it could cross-link there and generate the fluorescence. But again, this one also did not generate fluorescence and neither did the ones where we had the four flora trip in there at all. So clearly not just any protein can do it, but, and this now sort of makes, makes me really pleased that Jeff is here. His people, Colin and Kumaran, looked or searched the PDB for us, if there are any proteins that would have a similar trip-free configuration 
as seen in SIP A. And the way we did it was that we restricted the distance between the center of the tryptophan ring and the center of the phenylalanine ring to four to six angstroms, and then looked at an angle that was defined by this from the center of the phi ring to the center of the six member trip ring to the C7 atom of the trip to roughly zero to 10 degrees. Unfortunately, they came out with 589 hits, which is really a lot to work with. And then painstakingly, Man Man ran through all of those hits and checked whether there would be a possibility. She didn't make 590 possible proteins. She made some, and one of them is an interesting protein. It's a designer protein that was made by Bill DeGrado as a small molecule ligand binder. And in the APO state, where there is no small molecule bound, the disposition of the phi and the trip ring is not quite in the right sort of orientation. This is superimposed here for the blue is the PS1 structure and the gray is the SIP A structure. So it doesn't quite fit, but in the hollow state, it fit much better. So we just assumed maybe it's flexible enough that it could introduce maybe a crosslink between those two amino acids. So what Man Man did, she made the protein, she made the seven fluoro trip APOPS1 and put it into the fluorimeter. And as you can see here, we could or she could generate for this protein, the fluorescence. And if you look at the mass spec data, indeed, we are losing roughly a 20 Dalton peak out of there which means that we do defluorinate the protein and clearly now have a tryptophan 69 to phenylalanine crosslink in this particular protein. Another question was, does it always have to be a phenylalanine or could there be a crosslink that is generated between a tryptophan or the 7 fluoro trip and a tyrosine? For, to answer that question, she changed the phenylalanine 60 in cyclophilin A to a tyrosine. And again, we can generate the fluorescence. This is now a faster reaction, roughly 0.1 per second compared to 0.06 uh, per minute for the phenylalanine one. We have similar excitation and emission peaks, and we lose the fluorine by mass spec. So yes, indeed, there is a possibility to also form a crosslink between the original seven fluoro trip when it loses the fluorine atom and a fee. So we have this and with this, I want to just wrap up because I had very little time left, but I only wanted to tell this one story that there is a very unusual photoreactivity -re that can be introduced into proteins when you replace a single tryptophan with seven fluorotryptophan and you have nearby aromatic rings. So for all of you in the audience, who love to fluorinate your tryptophans, be aware that something can else can happen in your protein, not just a benign substitution. The crosslink generates this fluorescence. It has a very large quantum yield and the fluorescence lifetime is 2.4 nanoseconds. It does not, in this case of cyclophilin A, change the structure a lot. And it was 
a big puzzle for us to get to find out what the structure looks like. But now that we have the precedent in cytophilin A and in some other proteins that this can be generated, maybe this will be a way to make interesting new fluorescent probes out of proteins that was a completely unexpected result when we just wanted to use fluorine enema to probe the cyclophilin A capsid interaction. With this, I really have to pay homage to Man Man, who almost single-handedly solved this puzzle of this unusual generation of a highly fluorescent species. She interfaced with Dima, and as I said, Dima was the person who ran Len Lenny Brand's lab. Lenny passed away last year, just a week after his 90th birthday, and he ran a fluorescent lab at Hopkins for over 30 years. The mass spec was carried out with you. She was a mass spec person here at the University of Pittsburgh, and we are indebted to Charles for making the topology file for the cross-linked species that is responsible for the fluorescence. And with this, I thank you for listening. And if anybody wants to work on this or other related projects in my lab, if you're a student out there, contact me. I always are uh, interested in having people who like to solve puzzles like Man Man did. Thank you very much, Angela, for sharing the brand new data and uh, such an uh, interesting observation. Uh, so uh, I remind everybody to uh, please use the Q&A box for uh, putting your question. Uh, if you uh, want to speak directly to Angela, we can also unmute you. So uh, we already have a question from Jeff. Jeff. Angela, fantastic. Uh, this, what, a, what a lovely story. Um, you, do, you just have this wonderful knack for, for picking up on these curiosities and, and extracting really new insights. You do it over and over again. Um, the um, uh, proteins that contain a single tryptophan are famous for exhibiting uh, room temperature phosphorescence. Uh, the ones that have multiple tryptophans don't because of the triple triplet quenching. But it raises the interesting question, uh, is this reaction going via the excited singlet or excited triple state. And I'm kind of jumping in here before Art because I, with his fluorescence background, I'm sure he, he'll address some, raise some of the same questions. But uh, more specifically, did you, I'm wondering if you thought about maybe trying the UV exposure in the presence of uh, number one, uh, triplet quenchers like cyclooctatetrine uh, or number two, uh, modulating the, the molecular oxygen, you know, from, uh, in particular, you, you know, trying to use very, you know, uh, very low oxygen conditions when you carry out the UV uh, reaction of, of seven fluorotryptophan. We, we haven't done any of that yet. As I said, this, this initial story is solving the puzzle for what was going on. And now there were lots of different things one can follow up with, both with the fluorescence and with what is the species. There is still some other species in there we don't know. It's, it doesn't have a quantum yield that we, we see for the cross-linked one, but certainly other things can go on and you can change a hundred million things in there and see what effect that has. No, we have not. Right now, what we did is to make absolutely sure all of the experiments were carried out under exactly the same conditions so we could equate what goes on in fluorescence with the NMR. Yeah. And uh, some of these photo crosslink species are, are side reactions in, a lot in photo kidnap experiments. And we, we fought that for a lot. We, we wanted to, to eliminate them. They were, they were a nuisance because you get these you know, small populations of these crosslink species in photo kidnap experiments, which are kind of a nuisance if you're trying to do 2D experiments, for example. And most people would have ignored what's going on, right? Why, why would you follow this up? But the, the fact that it actually has a quite, quite a high quantum yield, I think can be explored for imaging all kinds of things that have nothing to do with NMR, but NMR 
was the impetus for finding it. Uh, so Angela, I was going to ask as well um, about oxygen. Are the samples deoxygenated when you have them in the cuvette or is oxygen required here? Uh, they, they usually get deoxygenate before they go in, but we don't have the cuvette under helium or argon or something like that. And when you were doing the lifetime measurements, were you able to find out what the bleaching rate constant is for the fluorophore? I think it's it's all in the paper. Now it's 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 it will come out, and there are I think ten to fifteen pages just on the fluorescence in there. And the SI obviously there's a lot in there because then, um, for this to oh I I just missed it when you showed what's the absorption max of the of the fused ring. I, I can't do the, basically it's, it's, uh, it's mm -hmm. depending on which protein, it's slightly different, right? Mm -hmm. So it's around 330 for the one we start out with. Okay. And for the PS1, it's slightly different, but it's, it's roughly around there. Mm -hmm. And few things happen that don't also happen in nature. Um, and you've searched the PDB, obviously. But for this reaction to happen, presumably you need a leaving group at the seven position, which isn't the hydrogen in normal tryptophan. And I don't know what natural trip analogs are found in biology, but are there any natural analogs of trip that might be a leaving group? I haven't looked. Certainly, uh, there hasn't been a report of a non-canonical tryptophan that's used in proteins. I could imagine that maybe in one weird organism, the hydroxyl ones could be around, but I haven't seen any reports that those ones have been seen in nature. Oscar, before you jump in, maybe we uh, go to two of the questions in the Q&A. Sure, just yeah. go okay. ahead with the questions yeah. and ask us for words, no problem. So, so uh, Philip Neudecker asked, uh, maybe I missed this, but why do you get this particular distribution of a zoo of species? Is that an oh. equilibrium distribution or kinetic effects? Uh, which species? The two clusters of the... Uh... No, I, I guess what it related to what you see in the NMR spectra, that you see the multiple species which you then quantified. Because we, we, cannot, we cannot get the reaction to completion and we cannot isolate 100% pure cross-linked species. We tried and the best we can do is sort of get this enrichment going because by, by by all the methods we know, and we know a lot about protein purification, there was no way to get the cross-linked species out apart from using the capsid protein to get rid of the non-cross-linked species. Thank you. I mean, uh, if, I don't know if that answered the question, but maybe Philip can, can tune in later in the inofficial part. Uh, the second one is by Ulrich Lepesch. Uh, thank you for this nice talk. Have you tried doing in situ UV treatment in the magnet to follow the process? Mm -hmm. No, we haven't. We've talked about putting a uh, fiber down there and looking, but we haven't. Okay. Thank you, Oscar. Yeah, no, I, I, I was most intrigued. And I, I think it was great. Uh, I, I find that just spectacular. I have several questions. So the first one is that you, you use only the, the fluorescence uh, excitation, but you try to go to higher frequencies because in the end, this is a photochemical reaction. So yeah. uh, you, you tried other, other uh, I mean, uh, uh, higher energetic. Uh, so so the, the whole 
uh, excitation spectrum was ran and then also the emission. So all of that was done. Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, Not at one. one. I see. Uh, yeah. I, I see. Yeah. And then also in the tyrosine, like you actually have the same position. So you claim that it's actually the same, like uh, uh, the same reaction. So it would be. In I don't. I don't think so because in the tyrosine you have the hydroxyl there, and you would see a different mass difference. And we see the fluorine difference. That, so that, it cannot be the OH position. It cannot be the. I know it cannot be the four position. What it is, I don't know. Okay. Lots of questions can be followed afterwards. Yeah, agreed. And then the last thing, uh, this is just a, I mean, have you tried to? Uh, this is this is kind of a weird question, but have you tried to unfold the protein? Because this actually creates, uh, topologically speaking, you will have a, an enormous difference in stability just because you are actually uh, like. A... Uh, we we've done lots of things, but we we. We, we, we haven't unfolded the cross-linked protein because obviously we can't make 100% cross-linked. At least we haven't found it yet. But the question was, could you just take tryptophan and tyros uh, uh, phenylalanine, you mix it at very high concentration and see whether you get the reaction? No, you don't. We, we've done lots of weird things on the way. So and it's... The entropic, uh, because of yeah. the penalty, obviously. So maybe with that, uh, we close the official part, but not without thanking both speakers for uh, truly lovely presentations and exciting data. And also, of course, for the chairs for the uh, very nice introductions. And I would also like to take the opportunity to announce actually an extraordinary seminar, which will take place in one week on June 9th uh, by Kurt Wittrich.